Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord together this morning. And uh, on this last Sunday of 2021, I want to address the topic of love. You know, I've been considering, as I consider each year around this time, uh, what's the greatest gift of love that I can give my wife? It happens for at least a few weeks each year. I consider, what's the greatest gift of love I can give my wife? Some years it's been something she's asked for. And uh, other years it's been a surprise to her. Uh, Early in our marriage, Pam told me, please don't buy me expensive jewelry. I just lose it. (laughs) So, uh, Each year, I've noticed that her stocking, as we've aged, her stocking has more and more inexpensive jewelry in it. (laughs) Gifts uh, of tokens of love. How do you best love the people around you? How do we best love one another? I want to... I want to answer that question this morning by asking it from a different perspective. I I want to ask this, what is the greatest obstacle to loving? What is the greatest obstacle to loving? Because if if we can remove the greatest obstacle to love, then I think we have greater capacity to love more fully. Doesn't that make sense? It kind of makes sense to me. If there's something that keeps me from being able to offer more love, I should remove that something so that I can more freely offer that love. I I have a conviction after 35 years of pastoral ministry, I have a conviction that the greatest obstacle to love is unforgiveness. The greatest obstacle to love is unforgiveness. The greatest gift I can offer Pam at Christmas as the year comes to a close is the gift of forgiveness. Now, don't misunderstand me. Pam doesn't need my forgiveness. Uh, You're gasping now saying, Pastor, what are you saying to all these people about your wife? No, no. What I'm saying is the greatest gift that I can offer Pam is the absence of unforgiveness in my life. If I can remove that obstacle to love, then I can love her more fully as we walk through this next year. So let me explain. If I withhold forgiveness to someone, the scripture is clear. I'm chained to that person emotionally because of my unforgiveness. And the the more I'm chained to someone else, the less I can actually express love to Pam. And so I need to unchain myself from any unforgiveness and people that I haven't forgiven so that I have more of me to offer to Pam. I believe the heaviest load or burden that some of you are carrying this December is the burden of unforgiveness. And it's limiting your capacity to love to love fully with no holdbacks. So my question is, what is the greatest expression of love that I can offer this Christmas? I believe it's the gift of helping you to forgive others so that you can then express love in its fullest capacity. My my mentor, Ray Dirksen, reminds me that there are three things that we need to know about forgiveness. First, we need to know that forgiveness is commanded by Jesus. Now, some of you aren't going to like this, but I I have to just say it as plainly as the scripture says it. Some of you, on the other hand, will resonate with this kind of approach. But the truth is, forgiveness is not an option. It's not delayable. It, It is demanded that every follower of Jesus, me and you included, simply do what we have to do to forgive. We do not have the luxury of wallowing in unforgiveness in our own pity party. That's just 
a component of our pride. So let me demonstrate that. Forgiveness is commanded by Jesus. The scripture teaches clearly, if we don't forgive others, he won't forgive us. It's just that simple. In Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, he says, so watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Some translations say 70 times seven times in a day. And they disciples had quite a reaction to this. They, were, they went ballistic. They said, what? Then increase our faith, they said. Why were they asking for more faith to this command of Jesus to forgive freely? Clearly, they were upset about this difficult requirement to forgive. They were essentially saying, well, if you expect me to forgive, then you better give me more faith. Because such forgiveness is too hard for me. And Jesus' response is brilliant. He, he responds to the request. First, he says this. He says, you already have enough faith. When was the last time Jesus responded that way to you when you asked him for more faith? And he says, hey, listen, when you came to faith in me, I gave you all you need, baby. You don't need any more. <laughs> he illustrated it by his little, little talk on a mustard seed. He says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say this to this mulberry bush, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey. You see, the mustard seed talk is in response to the request for more faith to forgive. Not sure if you've ever seen that link before. Second, Jesus is using this parable of the mustard seed. He, he's illustrating how they should have responded to him as their Lord. He goes on and he, he says this in, in verse chapter 17 of Luke in verse 7 to 10. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. What do you say to the servant when he comes in from the field? Come along now and sit down to eat. No, nah, wouldn't he rather say, prepare my supper and get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink, and then you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what the servant was told to do? The assumed answer here is no. So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, Jesus said, should say, we're unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. Notice, friends, that the point here is that the servant did what he was told to do. It was about obedience. Jesus was challenging them. You don't need more faith to choose to forgive. You just need to choose obedience in order to forgive. He was saying, when I, the Lord your God of the universe, tell you to do something, in this case, forgive, the only correct response is to obey and say, yes, sir. Now, forgiveness, admittedly, is very difficult for us. Why? Well, because we've been hurt. And there's usually a lot of pain when we're hurt. And yet Jesus pressed them on this issue, and he left them no exit from this doorway to life, to freedom, to love more fully. He said, you must forgive because unforgiveness can hurt others as well as yourself in Luke 17 1 and 2 things that cause people to sin are bound to come but woe to that person through whom they come it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin there are many things that can cause little ones to sin, but a common cause of sin is unforgiveness, especially when the unforgiveness is from a parent and it's evident to a child as they're growing up. Now listen, this I, I don't want to I want to be down on us, but I need to speak some truth here in light of what the season of, of history that we're in. Many people accuse the church of not being relevant to the current world situation. People look at church attendance in North America on the decline, and they say, what's going on there? Why is the church in such decline? And they blame it on the church and on the organization and on the 
the elders and the pastors and the staff. And, and yet in 2012, a study was done in Canada asking young adults, why did you lose, leave church? And you know, the one number one response for young adults to have left church in the last decade was, was that what they heard from scripture didn't line up with what they saw in the lives of their parents. They went to church and they heard a gospel message of love and peace and forgiveness. And then all the way home, they listened to their parents moaning and whining and complaining about so-and-so at church or that person at church. And they actually saw exactly opposite. They heard about forgiveness, but around their supper table, they had roast pastor for lunch. <laughs> and so they said, hey, I, I, don't, I don't see the consistency here. And so they said, I don't want anything to do with that. If the gospel message, mom and dad, doesn't influence your life enough to change you, to forgive, that many, many young people in that generation watched as their parents had disagreements with church leadership, and then they simply left the church out of anger, choosing not to reconcile, not to work things through, not to forgive one another. And the children said, hey, if that's as good as it is for you, then it's probably not something that I want for my life. This is why forgiveness is demanded from Jesus, because it actually can destroy the church. It can destroy my life. It can destroy my relationship with you. It can destroy your relationship with one another as the church. Second thing Ray says we need to know is that forgiving others is a process. Forgiveness has to be a choice in obedience, and it doesn't just happen in, in an instant. Forgiveness is a process. Many who follow Jesus think that it's got to be immediate. So I say I forgive and I forgive and I don't have to ever think about it again. Well, then you and I both know the next morning we wake up and that ache is still there. It's back again. And then we have to choose to forgive again. As many times as the pain comes back, we choose to declare our forgiveness and we choose to live in peace. And you know, eventually our emotion will catch up with the decision that our brain made to forgive. It's just that our emotions take a little longer to catch up. But when we say, I forgive, it's done. The pain comes back. We have to deal with that again as many times as it comes. Eventually, the memory will come back without the pain, and you'll know you've forgiven. The process is done. When you can remember and pray for that person, when you can remember and actually reach out and do something positive to bless that person, or when you can speak a blessing over that person, then you'll know that you've forgiven them. Some people struggle with forgiving people who have already passed away. And they say, how do you forgive someone who hurt me when I was younger and they're already passed on? And, and there are some who will go and visit a gravesite of the deceased, and they will speak words of forgiveness over the gravesite because that helps them process that emotionally. And if that's what you need to do, go ahead and do that. Remembering that Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, uttered these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. You see, followers of the way, followers of Jesus are called to forgive. Because he forgave and modeled it for us, even though he was being tortured. The expectation from Jesus is obvious. Forgiveness is not a choice. It's a command. Forgiveness actually takes time. It's a process. Forgiveness also comes with benefits. And these benefits are experienced over time. Uh, we will experience healing as we forgive. Uh, some people will even experience a physical healing. Research has, this, has shown that bitterness can impact both physical and mental well-being. So if we choose to remain bitter and unforgiving, it can actually deteriorate our mental health, our emotional state, and our physical health. Psalm 38 backs this up as well. You may or may not have read this before. Psalm 38 verse 3 says this. There is no soundness in my flesh because of 
your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. In fact, all along the Bible cautions us that sin can impact our health negatively. Another verse in Psalm 31 verse 10 says this, For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity. That's sin. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. So when we have unforgiveness and bitterness in our hearts, we can be consumed with all those thoughts and it can exhaust us emotionally. It can harm us physically. And then your choice to forgive will keep others from experiencing pain as well. If a person is carrying unforgiveness, it will spill over from them and it will harm others. I gave that illustration of parents not forgiving someone at church and then it spills over to their children and spills over to their spouse or a co-worker. And if we choose to forgive, then we have the opportunity to stop it right there and keep it from harming others. Third, our, our, our choice to forgive can inspire others to do the right thing. Am I the only one in the room who reads those words, Father, forgive them for they know what, not what they do, and then takes those words into my life? I, I have this story. I've told this many times. I was in uh, grade 12. Back in our grade 12 day, there was still a scripture reading from the Psalms and the Lord's Prayer after the, uh, the national anthem was played in our morning opening exercises in high school. And uh, I, I was the leader of the Christian uh, student organization in our school. So I was kind of targeted by my friends from my hockey team and the football team. And so they would, they would take elastic bands and little half a paper clip or a paper wad rolled and bent over. And from the back of the room, as soon as I bowed my head in prayer for the Lord's prayer, you would hear them zinging through the air and hitting the back of my head. I'd have a pile of paper or paper clips behind me on the floor at the end of the opening exercises from them, and all I can remember of those experiences was praying silently, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God, have mercy on my friends. They don't get it. They don't understand that when they mock my faith, they're mocking you. So please have mercy on them. That's the power of forgiveness. We can inspire others to do the right thing. Jesus said, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And then finally, for your forgiveness, you will receive an eternal reward. And I know that it's not in fashion these days to talk about eternity in, the, in terms of there will be a reward for us in eternity. But the scripture is clear. When we get to heaven, we won't just be sitting, singing hymns together. Uh, there will be a life to be lived. Some will be, will be working. There will be worship. And there will be a reward handed out in heaven for what we've done here on earth as we live following Christ. I know that's not popular, but if you read the New Testament, it's really clear. It's there. We will receive an eternal reward. Jesus was the life expert on forgiveness. He challenged his fathers in Matthew 5, verse 46. If you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Are you not that even the tax collector is doing that? His challenge was to forgive those who are your enemies. The rewards that we receive are rewards in heaven. and They're in part connected to whether or not we're willing to forgive one another here. I am going to run through several steps in the process of forgiveness. And I, I know that you all have access to how do you forgive. And uh, in, as we go through the discipleship track in the way uh, these steps will be laid out and you will go through them uh, in a much, much deeper way. But first, we get ourselves right with God. The truth is, if I realize that I need to forgive someone, the truth is I probably have been harboring unforgiveness for a while. So I need to say, Lord, forgive me for not forgiving them. Let's just get that right so that I can start on the right foot. 
Secondly, then I need to stop rehearsing the wrong. Do you ever find yourself arguing with nobody but everybody, but you're on your own? And you're having an, an out loud argument because you're angry at someone that you haven't forgiven. And so we need to stop rehearsing the wrong. We need to stop seeking to punish the offender. Thirdly, we need to listen for what God wants to say to us about the offender. This is hard because usually what we learn when we listen to what God wants to say is that he loves them. Uh, is that they're not the only wrong one in the situation. Uh, maybe there was something I did to provoke that. because We don't like hearing what God wants to say when we stop long enough to listen to what God's saying. But we need to. Forgiving others is a great way to practice hearing God's voice. God will speak to us. He'll give us his perspective on why the offender was driven to act the way they did, perhaps. He may help me see what they were actually hoping to accomplish by their actions. Sometimes people offend us and they don't even intend to. We just take it the wrong way. Fourth, we ask God if there's anything that we did to contribute to the situation. Fifth, we listen for what God wants to say to us personally. He may want to encourage us. He may want to just comfort us. He may want to say, hey, welcome to sharing in my sufferings. And then sixth, we listen for how Jesus turned what was intended for evil into something good. Was it evil that people cheered for Jesus to be crucified? Crucify him, crucify him. There were various other people involved in this act. It was evil for sure. But in Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible summarizes Jesus' perspective on that event. He says this, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Well, that's a different reaction than what I would have to this situation. You see, we listen for how Jesus turned what was intended for evil into something good. Don't waste the experience of pain. Lean in. Ask God what he's trying to teach you in your season of pain. And grow from that. What was it someone said? God whispers to us in a happy season and then he raises his voice a little when we're aggravated. But when we're in a season of pain, God screams to us. Sometimes we waste our seasons of pain by screaming at God and screaming at others. But when we're in pain because we've been hurt and we're in that position of needing to forgive, lean in and listen to Jesus as the Spirit speaks to you. And don't waste the experience of pain. And then pray for the offender. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Jesus really isn't leaving us a lot of wiggle room, is he? to be free to unforgive, to stay in unforgiveness, to harbor bitterness. He's just shutting the doors going, nope, I love you too much to waste your time on earth not loving fully. Number eight, bless and do good to your offender. If you're the victim of any form of abuse, you don't have to go back into that offender's presence. You don't have to. Do not subject yourself to mistreatment again. Be very cautious about further contact. Sometimes in those situations, all you can do is bless them and pray for them from a distance. And finally, ask the Lord to heal your heart and fill you with the Father's love for that person who hurt you. Only God can heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. 
you know, I'm a pretty good pastoral care pastor. I'm gifted the gift of shepherding. But I can't feel those wounds in your heart. I have no capacity to do that. I can help bring you to a place where you will let Jesus heal them. And I love to do that. But only God can heal your broken heart. Only he can bind up your wounds. Only he can heal you to a place where you now have a new capacity to express love in an unhindered way. And finally, I, I want to also say forgiveness does not necessarily mean that you trust again. There are some actions that humans take against other actions, other humans, uh, that it would be unwise to trust unconditionally again. Those who continue to live in a pattern of hurtful sin do not deserve trust. We need to be wise. We need to be discerning. We need to not be foolish and subject ourselves to more and more and more hurt from people who are just abusive. Pray for them. We bless them from a distance. Trust and forgiveness are two separate issues. And you know forgiveness is not justice. There's no justice in forgiveness. Jesus hung on a cross, died paying the price for my sin and yours. There's no justice in that. The, the just died for the unjust, the scripture says. He chose to be in our place, to take the weight of our sin that we might be forgiven by God. When we choose to forgive someone, you know what we do? We choose to own the consequences of their sin. We choose to bear the pain and then to be healed by God and released. And we release them. Now, just before we finish, the bondage of unforgiveness may not be only preventing the offended from offering the fullest extent of love to others. If you, if you know you've offended someone else and have not asked them for forgiveness, then you also may be limiting your capacity to love. I don't like this. Matthew chapter 5, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Why would Jesus tell his followers to go and be reconciled before offering their gift? Because Jesus is returning us to the idea that anything which causes broken human relationship needs to be addressed, and it needs to be addressed immediately. If you need to forgive, then forgive. Do you need to go and ask forgiveness? then go and ask forgiveness. Those of you who've been part of this church for many years have observed with your own eyes some Sundays on Communion Sunday when your pastor is serving communion and doesn't participate himself in the bread and the cup. And that's because the Holy Spirit has spoken to me in the moments leading up to communion and said, something's not right between you and so-and-so. Go and get that right. And so my prayer as we take communion and I serve publicly is, Lord, I commit myself to go and make that right as soon as I can, and I will refrain from offering my gift until I make that right, until I go and ask forgiveness. And, and, and it's not a bad thing to not take communion together in order that I might be reconciled to a brother or sister in Christ first. Boy, I tell you, when that happens, the next time I take communion, such sweet fellowship with the Lord. He's teaching us as we go. You know, some followers of Jesus love to speak often over the top about love. Love, it's all about love, it's all about love. But they forget the reality that harboring unforgiveness is an obstacle to loving fully. Friends, there's no greater gift that I can give you as this year ends, as you come up into these last few days of 2021, and you're going to turn the page into a new year, and you might make some New Year's resolutions. There's nothing better you can do than to choose forgiveness and reconciliation as you move into the new year so that you can move into 2022 with a deeper and fuller capacity to love than you have had ever. Oh, may it be 
that God would free us to be reconciled to one another, to choose forgiveness, to choose to ask for forgiveness so that we can move into this new year with no barriers to loving fully. Love is deeply connected to forgiving and asking for forgiveness. In the book of James, chapter 5, we read, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Friends, it's true. Forgiveness from God. Answers to prayer from God. Acceptance of our offerings by God. Including, including our praise and our, our acts of service healing. All these things are connected to proper relationships with one another. And the biggest barrier to that is unforgiveness. I love the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus is walking through town and he says, hey Zacchaeus, come on, we're going to party at your house tonight. And Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, a tax collector, he's up a tree hiding from the crowd because everyone hates him. And Jesus comes and suppers in his home. And immediately Zacchaeus repents and asks for forgiveness and get this, offers restitution. Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus responded and saying, Today, salvation has come to this house. For this man, too, is a son of Abraham. He hadn't been acting much like a son of Abraham. But Jesus offered him forgiveness and declared him as a son of Abraham. Evidently, Zacchaeus believed and repented. And the evidence of his repentance was the restitution. Friends, sometimes when we ask forgiveness, we need to also be able to offer restitution for the offense made. So how do you fully love? You fully love by removing the barrier of unforgiveness so that there is no chain between you and someone else when you go to offer love. I can approach Pam and offer her my fullest love because I'm not chained to a bunch of other people that I haven't forgiven. Oh, that's freedom. Oh, that's freedom. That's life to Jesus. friends. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your great love for us. We love because you first loved us. And by your grace, we declare we will forgive because you forgave us. Guide us as we seek to walk and live life in full surrender to you forgiving those who offend us, asking forgiveness of those whom we offend. Let us walk in unity that the body of Christ might be strong and that we might have capacity to fully express deepest love to one another. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord one more time as we respond to his word this morning.